we have been discussing flow through porous media, solved different examples and uh, tried to convey this message that in what way the flow modeling can be done. We have also talked about the hydraulic conductivity, the coefficient of uh, permeability and I uh, will discuss a bit more on coefficient of permeability in today's lecture. So, basically K depends upon several factors and uh, these factors are the porosity or void ratio, the particle size distribution, characteristics. We have used this concept of D10 and so on. The third parameter on which the K depends upon is the shape and orientation of the particles. The fourth parameter on which it depends upon is the saturation. and normally we define this as S. The another parameter on which it would depend is the type of cations which are present in the soil mass and the thickness of diffuse double layer. DDL stands for uh, diffused double layer. We also call this as the adsorbed layer and which is an indication of the activity of the minerals. So, if you remember the way we have defined K, we said K is equal to capital K multiplied by uh, rho upon mu into G and where capital K we have defined as the intrinsic permeability. So, basically K depends upon the density of the fluid and the viscosity of the fluid and these two get influenced by the temperature, alright. Now, this is a complete matrix. So, how the environmental conditions influence the hydraulic conductivity or coefficient of permeability because they affect the density and viscosity of the fluid which is permeating and these are the other parameters. So, the first parameter if you want to understand what is the influence of the porosity or the void ratios, this is what is known as the kozni karman relationship. This relationship is valid for uh, uh, mostly coarse grain materials. And it is written as the coefficient of permeability is equal to 1 upon C 
multiplied by t square into s square c is the shape factor it's understood that if the particles are spherical in nature coefficient of permeability is going to be higher as compared to the particles which are flaky or the particles which are angular or subangular t corresponds to the tortuosity if you remember uh, we have talked about this in the previous lecture tortuosity factor is the length of the tortuous path divided by the L is the physical or you may say the this is tortuous path is nothing but the microscopic path or microscopic length and this is the macroscopic length. T O R T O U S tortuous. So, this is a square of t term and s corresponds to the specific surface I hope now you can realize that it is not going to be easy to determine these coefficients and this parameter these parameters can be obtained with the help of advanced instrumentation. So, this is E cube over 1 plus E multiplied by the density of water upon viscosity of water. The best way to find out shape factor would be laser microscopy. You can define the term that how the shape looks like. Tortuosity factor is a very difficult parameter to determine unless you go for some advanced instrumentation scheme like uh, uh, CT scanning, all right, or 4D X rays. These are the techniques which are being used nowadays. This equation is normally not utilized for uh, fine grain soils. All right. Basically, what it indicates is that k is a function of e, and you will find different variants in the books where people have tried with e upon 1 plus e also, but this is quite prevalent and this is what is known as Kozni Karman relationship. shape and orientation of the soil particles you remember we have talked about the shape already so granular materials which are spherical in nature so this is number 3 spherical grains show very high hydraulic conductivity for the same density remember as compared to the fine grain materials. Now, as far as the orientation of the particles is concerned, I hope uh, you remember this equation or sorry relationship which I had plotted some time back when we were talking the about the compaction curve and what I had shown is that if this happens to be the OMC, you have the variation like this. All right. So, this is how the variation of permeability or the coefficient of permeability would be with respect to moisture content. So, at OMC the k value is minimum on dry of optimum the hydraulic conductivity increases a bit with increase in the moisture content 
and the best way to learn this would be the compaction curve if you remember. So, this is the moisture content and this is the gamma d. So, these two are in combination to each other. Another thing we are here we should remember is that on I am sorry it is not dry of optimum this is bed of optimum you should correct me and this is dry of optimum all right. So, dry of optimum we have uh, particles which are highly disoriented all right we call them as flocculated. And on the wet of optimum, we have the particles which are more dispersed. So, by definition or by fundamental nature, uh, a dispersed structure shows less hydraulic conductivity as compared to the flocculated structure. Then we talk about uh, the formation also. And when I say formation, this could be basically geological formation. There are two types of systems we come across. This is the layered soil mass and once you say layer number 1, layer number 2, layer number 3, it so happens that this has become heterogeneous soil mass, clear. But the assumption here is that each layer is isotropic in nature. So, I will be discussing more about this isotropic nature or heterogeneity of the material. What isotropy indicates is if I take a point and if I measure its properties in the x, y and z direction, all the properties are going to be same. This is the isotropy, fine. But because of the multilayered system, it becomes inhomogeneous or heterogeneous. So, a heterogeneous system could be isotropic layer wise. So, isotropic nature means the properties are same at a given point in all the three dimensions, alright. Now, this type of formation may occur in nature by virtue of deposition. You remember we had talked about all these things quite earlier when we are talking about the how soils are formed. So, in this case, we would be very eager to know what happens to the hydraulic conductivity when the flow is taking place perpendicular to the bedding direction. So, this is the flow which is perpendicular to the plane of bedding. What is bedding? Sediments are being carried by the rivers and because of the density contrast or because of the gravity they settle down. So, the formation of the entire soil mass is taking place layer wise. Horizontal lines which I have shown are the bedding planes and this indicates uh, the discharge in the vertical direction which is perpendicular to the plane of bedding. I will be more interested in also finding out what would be the QH. So, this is the horizontal flow of the fluid which is taking place through a layered system, alright. Now, in, I hope you can realize that this is going to be the parallel to the bedding. Now, as far as the saturation is concerned, there is a relationship between K and S. So, saturation of the soil is defined as, I hope you understand uh, the amount of water which is present in the pores to the volume of the pores, okay. So, normally this is a cubic relationship. Those of you who might get a chance to work in all these petroleum companies 
Schlumberger and what not shell. Uh, you will be using throughout your life this type of a relationship because soils are not going to be saturated always. Why? Because you have a lot of methane, a lot of gases trapped in the sediments clear. So, this is a relationship which you are going to use. Normally, we define saturation as something which is greater than uh, 90 percent. All right. So, if soil sediments are approximately or greater than 90, 95 percent, we call them as saturated. If not, they become unsaturated and about 30 percent less than we define them as dry. All right. So, this is the relationship as far as saturation is concerned. Now, what is going to happen to the type of the cations? The more presence of active minerals, all right. So, if active minerals their fraction increases, I have defined this as active minerals, all right. What is your guess? So, the more the active minerals present in the system, the double diffuse layer is going to be quite big. The resistance offered by the system to the fluid flow is going to be less and hence your hydraulic conductivities are going to be less. The same thing is valid for the cation exchange capacity also, all right. Number 6, I think this we have already discussed. So, uh, K would be proportional to density of the fluid, all right and inversely proportional to the viscosity of the fluid. Is this okay? So, a denser fluid is going to permeate easily provided its viscosity is less. Is this part clear or vice versa? Any questions? We have also talked about the methodologies for determination of K. So, until now we have discussed two methods which are mostly the laboratory methods. If you remember, these are the constant head test, and the falling head test, there is another test which we will be defining very shortly when we talk about the consolidation characteristics of soils. So, I can use a consolidometer. to obtain the k value. This is to be discussed slightly later when we discuss about the consolidation characteristics. As I said, another method would be a triaxial method or triaxial test. As far as the in situ tests are concerned, Uh, what we do is number one a uh, pumping in test so we'll discuss about this or it could be a pumping out test what we do is we drill a well and then pump out water or pump in water and we see how much the drop in the head is going to take place in unit time there's another series of tests which is known as uh, the packers test All right. There is another interesting way of defining the permeability of the formations under in situ conditions, particularly those of you who will get a chance to work in deep excavations in rock mass would be Lugion test. We call this as Lugion index. So, this is what is used for you know. Uh, fractured rock mass.
incidentally one of the ways to define the hydraulic conductivity would be in the units of Darcy also. So, K can also be defined in the form of Darcy. All right. Depends upon in which continent you are working and uh, in what type of problems you are uh, working. Any questions related to this? No? All right. So, let me take up now uh, some in situ tests. When we talk about the in situ tests, uh, we have to be very particular about in what type of aquifer I am working. This could be the confined aquifer. In your hydraulics course, I am sure you must have studied this. And the second one is the unconfined aquifer. So, by definition, suppose if this is the ground level and if I drill a well, this is a bore well. Sometimes people also term is that term this as a tube well. It is basically a bore well. You are boring into the soil, cutting the soil and putting down a casing and most of the time this casing is perforated. All right. So, this becomes a bore well. That means, you have bored the soil and then you have lowered down the stainer or a casing which is made up of steel to support the soil otherwise soil will collapse and the well is not going to function. So, this is perforated and suppose we have a water layer somewhere here, initial water layer somewhere here. This is the water table, not water layer, sorry, water table. And somewhere here you have a hard rock. All right. And this is the soil mass. The system in which the boundaries are not defined, clear, and they are open, this becomes unconfined aquifer. Okay. So, you have to monitor closely the difference between 2 and 1. When I draw the figure for 1, I am just discussing now the unconfined aquifer case. Now, suppose if I start pumping out water, what is going to happen? this water table is going to diminish lower down clear we had talked about effective stress analysis when the lower water, when the uh, ground water table decreases so imagine there is a building somewhere over here all right and without telling you someone starts a industry and he or she is trying to suck out all the water for creating let's say utility items now, what is going to happen? This water table is going to subside. Is this okay? Because of the discharge pumping out operations. This is the steady state situation. I would say a final state because I have written steady state. Is this okay? Now, the way these tests are done is you create a well of certain dimension, you start pumping out and then you create two observation wells. So, observation wells could be located in the vicinity, this is observation num well number 1, this is observation well number 2 and what we are going to observe? How much the ground water has depleted? Is this okay? Delta H in both the cases. So, this is in ground, this is in the well number 1, observation well number 1, this is observation well number 2.
I hope you can understand that this delta H is nothing but again the discharge which is taking place. No, sorry, this has been created because of discharge Q. Is this okay? Q has caused this delta H1 and delta H2 to appear. Now, suppose if I define uh, the well radius as capital R from the radial distance to this is let us say R1, this is R2, all right. And suppose if I take at a distance of R another hypothetical well which represents a hypothetical surface which represents a hypothetical surface okay so this is a hypothetical surface i hope you can realize when you are pumping out water the discharge is going to take place perpendicular to the surface is this correct have you understood this so this is a sort of a cylindrical curved surface perpendicular to this the discharge is going to occur so if this is r and thickness of this element is dr clear height of this surface is let us say h fine can i write a relationship between q as a function of r1 r2 h1 h2 and so on because q is nothing but k into i into a is this okay so k is a principal unknown remember we are doing the field test to obtain the coefficient of permeability what is i area is not an issue area i can obtain what is the area the curved surface will be 2 pi r into h is this okay so i need not to bother about this thing so that means area will be 2 pi r into h what is i hydraulic gradient now how would you find out the hydraulic gradient now this is where we have to take help of a theory which is known as dupitt's theory this is valid only very close to the wells so as you go away from the well what you will observe is dupitt's theory is not valid because this curve flattens now as per dupitt's theory the slope of this line corresponds to the i value that means del h upon del r would be equal to i is this okay now what we know we know the value of q because the moment i start pumping out test i know how much volume of water i have taken out per unit time so q is known i have two observation wells why because if you substitute these values over here you will realize that this is going to be a quadratic equation so k into del h upon del r multiplied by 2 pi r into h okay so k i into a so i can write this as del r upon r equal to k by q and 2 pi into h into del h is this okay so del r upon r equal to k by q del h 2 pi h now this becomes my governing equation i can solve this easily what I have to do? The whole idea of creating two observation wells was I know the R1, I know the R2. Clear? I know the total values of heads and I can solve this expression. Is this okay? So, what I can do? I can use a sort of a magnetic tape, not magnetic tape, I can use a device 
electronic device I will lower it down the moment it gives me a beep it is understood that I have touched the water table I know this value similarly I know this value I can substitute over here and I can get the values of k. The difference between this situation which is now so basically what is the difference between unconfined and confined aquifers the more you take out water the more water table keeps on drowning there is no constraint on this. So, these type of aquifers are known as unconfined aquifers. Now, suppose if I introduce a layer of aquifer in this manner, this is the ground surface and this is the layer of the aquifer. This is the hard rock. this is the ground surface and this happens to be let us say a clay of seam of clay and I am pumping out water I hope now you realize that this is what is going to be the soil mass and what has happened? The soil mass is now constrained between the two impermeable boundaries 1 and 2 clear. So, what is going to happen? Your this surface is always going to be bound by this. Is this okay? So, that means when you have put a constraint on the porous media through which the discharge is going to take place this becomes a confined aquifer case. Here what is happening? Here the surface area is changing with respect to time. The more you pump out this value of H keeps on dropping down. Here this is going to be constant and then what about the water table? The water table would be somewhere here. This is the initial water table okay and the more and more I suck it out what is going to happen? It has to be below this that is it. So, if you solve this expression what is going to happen here this uh, your area term will be if I take it as a distance of r this will be 2 pi r into h, h remains constant. Now, we are going to use these concepts quite a lot in our analysis. So, what we have talked about until now is coefficient of permeability, what are the parameters on which it depends, how to obtain uh, permeability, coefficient of permeability in the laboratory, in the field, then these two situations and uh, I hope this helps you, it's okay. So, one more thing I would like to uh, discuss that is the unsaturated hydraulic conductivity. So, until now what we have discussed is about the saturated states of the material. Present day geomechanics is heading towards unsaturated state of the material. So, sometimes people also want to know the unsaturated soil hydraulic conductivity. KU. So, we are now differentiating you must have noticed very cleverly uh, the difference between K sat this was all K saturated alright and K u there are many schools including the Cardiff where most of the guys are working only on K u why because most of the geotechnical engineering applications are related to unsaturated state of the material nuclear waste disposal, buried cables, buried pipelines, buried hydrocarbon facilities, nuclear explosions, municipal solid waste, all right, chemical reactions going on in the soil mass. So, everywhere you will find that the moisture front moves out and soil becomes unsaturated. So, it is a very interesting way of uh, obtaining it though it is not a very accurate solution, but to begin with I think you can use the concepts what we have discussed in the classroom. 
So, what normally is done is you take a glass tube and seal it from both ends by trapping some soil mass in it into it. So, this soil mass is unsaturated or let us say dry soil mass which is compacted at some gamma d. All right. Submerge the entire thing into a water bath. So, what I have shown here is the water bath. Is this okay? And let the moisture front move in the I can create different type of boundary conditions. Now, suppose if I shift, I think coming back to our discussion which we are having in earlier lectures, if I create at point 1 and point 2, where point 2 is the capillary interface. So, the moment I open the wall, what is going to happen? This water is going to enter into the dry soil mass and imagine uh, you can do this experiment also. You fill up the dry soil and then open the wall, let the water move in. So, this is the distance x in a given time t of the water front which is moving from left to right. Is this okay? You can imagine. Compute the total head at point 1 and compute the total head at point 2. Suppose if I say the total head at point 1 is 0. Suppose if I shift my datum somewhere here at a height of h, the elevation head is minus h and the piezometric surface would be h. So, total energy at this point is 0. What about this point? If I consider this point just on the left hand side of the water front, what will be the head on this point? Capillarity is the dry phase which is just being negotiated by the water. So, at point H2, the elevation is minus H and the capillary head is minus h c. So, the total head would be minus h plus h c. So, you know the hydraulic gradient. What is the length of the path x? I can do this experiment, I can measure the x over a period of time and I know how much x has moved in with t. H c is unknown, all right. So, the moment I know h upon x which is the hydraulic gradient, what is the value of discharge? And here I want to find out k unsaturated. So, this k will become unsaturated. Truly speaking, you may debate that Darcy's law is not valid for unsaturated hydraulic conductivity, but still we are trying to use it because there is no harm in getting something which is approximate as compared to very precise. Is this okay? So, if you know the area of cross section of the system, I is known, what are the principal unknowns? k is unknown and what else h c. What about the velocity term x by t, is this okay?
and if I want to find out seepage velocity, this will be x upon t upon porosity. I am not very sure about what is the saturation state, so I will put a penalty on this porosity. I will multiply by SR. So, what I have done? I have penalized the porosity. You understand what is the meaning of penalizing some parameter? Uncertainty. If SR is equal to 1, porosity is eta is fine. If SR is not equal to 1, this will be some fraction of porosity which is contributing to the whole process. So, now if I say that this Q is what k i into a and I know the V s term is all right. What I can do a into V s is going to be the discharge. Can I equate this function with this function? And then what is going to be unknown? x I can measure, t I can measure, k u and s c are unknown. So, in this equation you are going to have two unknowns. This is fine. So, what I should be doing? If I play with this h, so what did I tell you? I can raise and lower down the column of the saline solution or the water column. So, if I play with h, what is going to happen? I will be having different values of h. Let us say if I create h1 and h2 corresponding to time t1 and t2. Are you getting this point? So, I have two equations, I have two unknowns. I can solve them. So, those of you who might pursue your career in unsaturated state of soil mechanics, uh, your studies will start from this point onwards. So, let us move on now to the layered systems of soils. Until now, we have been all, we have been considering all homogeneous isotropic situations. Clear? Now, let us introduce into it inhomogeneity non-homogeneous sometimes people call it. Inhomogeneity is a better word. So, how inhomogeneity will be introduced? By considering layers, what we were discussing there. Now, the mechanics part is coming in. The hydrostatics we did, then we started with the hydrodynamics of the porous media here and now we have related the hydrodynamics to the different field applications. And now we are going to come to the extremely real life situation. So, that is what we discussed over there, the way the formation of the deposits occurs. So, if I consider a layered system of soil mass, so this is layer number 1. Layer number 2, layer number 3 and so on. We might be having layer number n as well. All right. I repeat, it is a inhomogeneous system, heterogeneous system of soil mass because you have different layers. But what we are assuming is that each layer is isotropic in nature. That means, at a given point, the properties, density, void ratios, hydraulic conductivity are going to be constant. In most of the pumping out tests, what happens? Fine particles from the soil mass get washed out, clear? So, why pumping out tests are detrimental to the safety of structures? When you are pumping out water excessively, the chances are all the fines will also move out. And the moment fines move out, the density of the system is going to decrease because remember the fine fraction only contributes to the density of the system. Why? You have a system like this and all these fine particles were making the system more compact dense. Now, when you are doing pumping out operation, all these particles have washed out because of what? I gamma w, previous lecture. See, the beauty of geomechanics is that you cannot study this in discreteness. Are you getting the application of all the concepts which I have discussed in last two, three lectures? All these fine particles are getting lifted up by I into gamma W per unit volume. 
So, the more and more pumping you do, the more and more hydraulic gradient develops clear and these particles get lifted up which results in a loss of void ratio and gamma d. The system becomes more porous, a more porous system the chances are that it will collapse, it will show more volumetric deformations, it will show more subsidence. Is the story clear? Fine. So, I have knit lot of concepts uh, together in today's discussion. So, let me attribute some dimensions to this. Let us say this is of length L and uh, x1 is the width, x2, x3. This is let us say I will simply say k1, alright. Life is already very complicated, so I am not changing other parameters k2, k3, and so on. I can create two situations here if you remember uh, flow taking place perpendicular to the bedding and flow parallel to the bedding, clear. Now, all of you have done uh, equivalent circuits resistances in series and parallel and batteries in parallel and series 10 plus 2 physics, hope sure. Can this system not be represented like now suppose if I ask you to fill in the blanks, what is flowing through this on the right hand side? Current, current gets distributed, is this correct? So, you said here that I gets distributed in the form of I1, I2, I3 and it comes out from the system. What remains constant? Very good. Voltage. Where is the voltage getting applied? Across the resistances. Clear? So, if you consider this as point number 1 and this as point number 2, what you said is the delta V12 remains constant. Is this okay? Suppose if I allow flow of water to take place through this, what is going to happen? Is this situation not similar to the one which I have drawn? Have you understood? Clear? As if multiple pipes are connected to this phase through which the discharge is going to take place. So, that means Q H is equal to q1 plus q2 plus q3 qn and the analogy is this. What remains constant? What remains constant is the voltage across not in this case voltage hydraulic gradient. So, if this is h a on this plane and on this plane if it is h b what is the hydraulic gradient? Hydraulic gradient would be delta sorry delta H equal to H A minus H B over length, this becomes I. Is this okay? Now, you can complete the whole exercise. So, your Q H will be equal to K equivalent horizontal. Is this okay? Multiplied by I, what is I? H A minus H B over L into area of cross section. What is the area of cross section? X1 plus X2 plus X3. Clear? And most of these aquifers or the soils beddings are going to be in the third dimension like this. Is this okay? So, this is going to be let us say uh, W width. I can always take perpendicular unit section of 1 meter length. So, as if sheets of the soils are sitting over each other. So, that means the area of cross section is going to be now x1 plus x2 plus x3 this multiplied by w. Is this part clear? No issues? Analogy is clear? And then now you know what is Q1, Q1 will be equal to K1, 
i x1 into w. Is this okay? So, you know all the expressions. Tell me what will be k h equivalent? Quick. Yes, very nice. So, this would be sigma k i into x i. Nice. Sigma. Very good. So, you have understood the whole thing. I could be 1 to n and this I will be also 1 to n. Is this part clear? No confusions? Now, if I revert the situation, so we have already got for h equivalent. Now, suppose if I change the direction of the flow or if I am interested in finding out what is going to happen to let us say k v equivalent. draw on your notebooks equivalent circuit first and try to understand what is getting distributed now. In this case, the current got distributed, agreed? Now, what is going to get distributed? Sorry, voltage, true. So, as if this system is current entering into a system of R1, R2, R3 and so on and about point number let us say that was a b like in the little direction here I can say x y no I will not use x y I will use let us say what should I use 1 and 2 okay. So, this is your point number 1 and this is your point number 2 as if multiple layers of the resistances are as arranged in a series manner, work out k equivalent, I think you must be remembering the equation also. So, how do you solve this function? So, if I say the q is entering into the layers and it remains q always, is this okay? So, this q is equal to, we know this or we have to measure this, this one will be equal to k1 into i1, what is i1? So, now this is going to be between 1, no, let us say this is a and b, h a minus h b over x i x1 into area of cross section, what is the area of cross section? w into l, like this you can complete the whole thing. What you are observing here is the next term is going to be H B minus H C. Is this okay? We did this problem in the last lecture also. Remember this case? I was talking about a situation where starting from P M 1, let us say P M material. I will create a multi layer system and then we were debating upon that at this point I do not know the head. I do not know the head at point B, C, D intermediate points, clear? So, how would you solve this equation or how would you solve this situation? Are you getting this point? The question here is I do not know what is the head at point B, C, D and so on. I hope you understand this. Insert piezometers and then do something. Otherwise, this is an interesting question. Otherwise, you have another equation in this form. This Q remains constant. Use this equation, correct? So, this is equal to this and this will be equal to the next one and so on. So, ultimately you are getting a relationship between H A, H B, H B, H C and the total head across this is going to be let us say H A and Z. So, this will be equal to K vertical equivalent multiplied by I. So, I will be 
एच ए माइनस एच जेड अपॉन एल वॉट इज द वैल्यू ऑफ एल एक्स आई सिग्मा इज दिस ओके फाइन मल्टीप्लाइड बाई डब्ल्यू इन टू एल दिस इज नथिंग बट द टोटल लेंथ ऑफ द सिस्टम द टोटल लेंथ ऑफ द फ्लो एंड योर एरिया ऑफ क्रॉस सेक्शन विल बी एल मल्टीप्लाइड बाई डब्ल्यू फाइन सो दिस इज गोइंग टू बी सेम एज ईच वन ऑफ दम एंड वॉट इज द रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन एच ए माइनस एच जेड दिस विल बी इक्वल टू एच ए माइनस एच बी the hydraulic gradient is getting dissipated or getting added up so this total head will be equal to this plus this plus this plus this so you write here this will be equal to this plus another term and so on so can you guess what will be the k vertical equivalent would be any guess वन अपॉन आर इक्वल टू वन अपॉन आर वन प्लस वन अपॉन आर टू दैट क्वेश्चन यू रिमेम्बर वॉट एपन्स इन केस ऑफ कैपेसिटेंस सी वन प्लस सी टू नाउ दिस कंसेप्ट नाउट इज बींग यूज इन जियो मैकेनिक्स टू क्रिएट इक्वेलेंट सर्किट्स ऑफ सॉइल्स एंड ऑन विच मेनी ऑफ दम आर वर्किंग सो वी डू इम्पिडेंस स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी एट वेरी हाई फ्रीक्वेंसीज एंड वी ट्राई टू गेट द रेस्पॉन्स ऑफ द मेटीरियल एंड वेन वी डू मॉडलिंग इन ऑल so uh, yeah tell me what this would be sigma xi very good sigma very nice please try to prove this what's your intuitive feeling which one is going to be more kh equivalent vertical or kh equivalent horizontal are you sure 100% so this proves that kh is greater than this one and hence mostly the flow of ground water is in the lateral direction and so on It's okay.